Greetings, this is Brother Eli with another episode of Bible Truth Revealed. Today's teaching is entitled, The Truth About the Unholy Communion. That is, the truth about the unholy communion. The communion is a pagan ritual that is also known as the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, and the breaking of bread. In this teaching, I will explain why righteous Israelites do not partake in this or any other pagan ritual. The teaching will be divided into four parts. Part 1. What exactly is communion? 2. The Pagan Origins of Communion 3. Why Righteous Israelites Do Not Take Communion and 4. The Holy Scriptures Cannot Be Used to Justify Taking Communion Part 1. What Exactly is Communion? In the New World Encyclopedia, under the heading Eucharist, Quote 1 says, The Eucharist is a sacramental or memorial reenactment of the Last Supper between Jesus and his disciples, in which Christians partake in the body and blood of Christ. It is also known as Holy Communion. Christians generally recognize a special presence of Christ in this rite, though they differ about exactly how, where, and when Christ is present. Some believe that they partake of the literal body and blood of Jesus. So some Christians believe that they are literally eating the body of Jesus and drinking his blood, which is transformed through the Eucharistic prayer of the priest, while others believe in a real but not physical presence of Christ in the Eucharist, while still others take the act to be a symbolic reenactment of the Last Supper. So if you are in a Hebrew-Israelite camp, that partakes in the communion or last supper. It means that you are a Christian. According to the piece of garbage called the New Testament, the Christian God-man literally told his followers to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Let's read about this in John chapter 6. Verses 53 to 56 and verses 60 to 61. That's John chapter 6, verses 53 to 56 and 60 to 61 in the King James Version of the Christian Bible. Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. What does this word indeed mean? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word indeed as without any question, truly, undeniably, in reality, all things considered and as a matter of fact, this means that according to the fiction 
when Jesus told his followers to eat his flesh and drink his blood, for his flesh is meat indeed, and his blood is drink indeed, he's saying, this is not a figure of speech. This is literal. You literally have to eat my flesh and you literally have to drink my blood. Synonyms for indeed are certainly. So you certainly have to do this. Clearly, definitely, doubtless, inarguably. So there's nothing to argue about. You really have to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Christian God-man to be a good Christian. Undeniably, undoubtedly, unquestionably, it doesn't get clearer than this. My flesh is meat indeed, unquestionably. Don't question it, just eat it. And my blood is drink indeed. Don't question it. Just drink it. And verse 56 again. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? If the disciples thought that he was speaking figuratively, metaphorically, symbolically, they would not have said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? This fictional account wants you to understand that the fictional God of our Christian slave masters truly told his followers to eat his flesh and drink his blood in deed. Verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? So does it offend you that the Christian God-man literally wants his followers to eat his flesh and to drink his blood? Does this offend you? Jesus told his disciples, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you are dead. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. If this offends you, just imagine how the Most High feels when he sees his children pretending to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Christian God-man. Now let's listen to a well-known Christian pastor explaining the ritual of the communion. This is your cup. Yes, sir. This is my cup. So, That's the cutting of the covenant. And then I would do the same. Jesus said, take this cup. This is my blood of the new covenant. Now we've mixed our blood. Which is his and which is mine. And we could never separate them. We can't separate that. Amen. That's it. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Now, now let, let me illustrate something else. Now, our blood has, symbolically has been mixed here. Now, at the communion table. Yes, sir. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant. 
all of you drink all of it. Judas had to drink that. Yes, sir. So, now, and I want you to be this way every time you take communion, and you want to take it a lot. A lot. So there we go again. The communion is a pagan ritual. And this has nothing to do with the children of Israel. Part 2. The Pagan Origins of Communion. In the New World Encyclopedia, under the same heading, Eucharist, Quote 2 says this. The Bacchic or Dionysian rites also included the sacramental partaking of wine and bread. So this is where the first communion comes from. With wine signifying the spirit and bread the manifestation of the spirit in matter or the body. So the bread represented the body. It continues. Elements of the Greek thanksgiving Eucharistia may also have been adopted in the early centuries of the Christian era for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. This shouldn't surprise any of us because it is a well-known fact that Christianity is a mishmash of pagan religions that simply gives lip service to the Most High while teaching its followers to break his commandments. What else should we expect from a religion that was invented by the children of Lucifer? Eating human flesh and drinking blood is one of the many ways that they pay homage to their God. For details of another pagan ritual that must be avoided by righteous Israelites, please listen to my teaching entitled, Is Water Baptism necessary for salvation? That is, is water baptism necessary for salvation? Part 3. Why righteous Israelites do not take communion? The idea of even symbolically eating human flesh or drinking blood is repulsive to the righteous remnant of Israel. It is clear to us that this pagan ritual is an abomination. Let's read Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and verse 14. This is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and verse 14, and I will be reading from the Brenton Septuagint translation. It says, And whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers abiding among you shall eat any blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will destroy it from its people. So we've seen that Jesus told his followers to drink his blood because his blood is drink in deed, undoubtedly unquestionably but the most high says that any israelite or any righteous stranger that consumes blood will be destroyed from its people verse 14 for the blood of all flesh is its life and i said to the children of israel ye shall not eat the blood of any flesh for the life of all flesh is its blood Everyone that eats it shall be destroyed. That is a warning. The Most High warned us not to consume blood. The oppressor, on the other hand, wants us to pretend to drink the blood of his God. This is a way to openly mock the Most High. What else should we expect? from the children of Lucifer. Part 4. The Holy Scriptures cannot be used to justify taking communion. Let's look at what happens when Christians are confronted by righteous Israelites 
about their unwise decision to partake in the pagan ritual of communion. Question that we have is that y'all just had the Passover. Now, according to the Passover that you kept, did you drink the wine to represent the blood of Yahweh Shah? We drank wine, yes. So you did drink wine. Why did you drink the wine? Because we drank the wine. The, the law says to. The law tells you to drink wine on the Passover? It's, that's the instructions given. Uh, can you show us that? Because we want to learn. <laughs> in, in Exodus 12, it doesn't line wine. No, but we drank wine. It seems to give the Lord uh, uh, drink offerings in the Torah, does it not? Yes. Okay, then, so there you go. This Christian just claimed that he drinks the wine of the communion as a drink offering to the Most High. Now that could not be further from the truth. The Most High did not ask us to give a drink offering as part of the Passover meal. But as this is a Christian, I will use a Christian resource to demonstrate that this is a lousy excuse and it is totally inaccurate. On www dot got questions dot org which is a very christian resource there is an article entitled what is a drink offering it says this the first recorded occurrence of a drink offering was that given by jacob in genesis chapter 35 verse 14 right after god changed his name to israel now, for those who are familiar with this verse, Jacob poured out the drink offering to the Most High. That's what you do. You pour it out. These Christians are not pouring out anything. They are drinking all of it. So you cannot use the excuse of a drink offering to justify your rebellion against the Most High. It continues. Drink offerings were also included with burnt and grain offerings in God-ordained sacrifices, including the morning and evening sacrifices of Exodus chapter 29, verse 40. One quarter hin, about one quart, of wine was poured out into the altar fire for each lamb sacrificed. Christians do not pour wine into altar fires. These Christians that are using drink offerings as an excuse to justify performing pagan rituals cannot use the Holy Scriptures to do so because even this Christian resource is explaining to you that a drink offering required the pouring out of the drink, the pouring out of the wine. If you're not pouring it out, it is not a drink offering. In fact, the Christian God-man told his followers to drink all of it. None of it was supposed to be poured out. So it is not a drink offering. Let's double check that in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 27. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 27 reads thus. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Drink ye all of it. None of the communion wine is supposed to be poured out onto the altar or anywhere else. Pagans have to drink all of it. Uh, at the communion table. Yes, sir. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant. All of you drink all of it. This means that it is not a drink offering. Repent. 
Let's see how the conversation continues. Let's go to John 6, verse 53 through 57. And I want you all to expound on that. Because what we teach after this, we teach that eating, eating bread to represent the Christ is cannibalism. We teach that drinking the wine to represent the blood of an arm of flesh is vampirism. So we teach y'all, we teach that y'all are teaching that you are vampires and that you are cannibalist, cannibalism. That's what we teach. Okay. And we want you to expound on John 6, verse 53, verse 57. We want you to expound on that. Let's have some fun with it. Okay. okay. I mean, but you honestly don't believe that any of us actually eat human flesh or drink blood, do you? No, we know we don't, but I'm just telling you what. Okay. We, we just okay. saying, okay. right, exactly. We're just saying what the book says. Yes. That's supposed to be a model of. Those of us that serve the Most High only and keep his commandments are fully aware that our rebellious brethren do not actually eat human flesh or drink blood. We also know that if they repent, which means to return to the Most High only and keep his commandments, they will be freed from the spiritual bondage that compels them to partake in ritualistic, symbolic cannibalism. All we can do in the meantime is teach our people to distinguish between holy and profane. The unholy communion is profane. In their desperate attempt to hold on to their pagan cannibalistic ritual, Christians even accuse the Most High of telling the Israelites to eat human flesh and drink blood. They claim that he said it metaphorically, but that this is the same as the abominable God-man commanding them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Listen to this madness. It's just unbelievable that the scripture says the simple believe of every word, but a wise man looketh into his going. The Almighty clearly told us not to drink no blood in Leviticus, the 17th chapter. So why are we even, why are we considering eating a man or drinking okay. this? It don't even sound right for a man to say, you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh. I mean, what, that's some old P. Diddy, R. Kelly stuff going on in this book. Okay, okay, cool. So watch this, because now you have to say this about the Most High God, you have Ezekiel 39 and 17 says, And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, That's right. speak unto every feathered fowl and unto every beast of the field, Assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you. Even a great sacrifice upon the mountain of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of, of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, and of, excuse me, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full, drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I sacrifice for you. Why would God tell us to do that? It's metaphorical, right? Just like when Yahweh Shai says, he's not telling us to physically eat his body. Or physically drink his blood. It's all representational and metaphorical. Now let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 39. So I can demonstrate. How that passage was butchered. By that rebellious Christian. That Christian just said. That the most high told us. To eat human flesh. And to drink blood. And he thinks he can justify it. By saying that the most high. Was speaking metaphorically. Why would God tell us to do that? It's metaphorical. I'm going to explain this passage and demonstrate and the Most High never told us to eat flesh or drink blood, even symbolically. Why would God tell us to do that? It's metaphorical. Ezekiel chapter 39. I will read verses 1 to 5 for context. Then verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 1 to 5 and verse 17. It reads thus, And thou, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Almighty, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, Ross, prince of Mesoch and Thorbel, and I will assemble thee, and guide thee, and raise thee up on the extremity of the north, and I will bring thee up upon the mountains of Israel. And I will destroy thy bow out of thy left hand, and thine arrows out of thy right hand. And I will cast thee down on the mountains of Israel, and thou and all that belong to thee shall fall. So far, the Most High is speaking of the destruction of his enemies, the destruction 
of this nation that opposes him. That's literal. There's nothing metaphoric when the Most High talks about destroying his enemies. It continues. And the nations that are with thee shall be given to multitudes of birds, even to every fowl. And I have given thee to all the wild beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall on the face of the field, for I have spoken it, saith the Almighty. The Most High is saying that when he is done destroying those nations, the birds will come and eat their flesh. The beasts will come and devour their dead bodies. There's nothing metaphorical about this. That's what the Most High created these birds for. The vultures, for example. This is why he created those wild beasts. When the Most High said this, he meant it literally. Let's continue to verse 17. And thou, son of man, say, Thus saith the Almighty, Say to every winged bird. These are the same winged birds from verse 4. And to all the wild beasts of the field. These are the same wild beasts from verse 4. Gather yourselves and come. Gather yourselves from all places round about to my sacrifice. His sacrifice is the slaughter of his enemies. It's still literal. There's nothing metaphorical about this. It continues, which I have made for you, even a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. And ye, meaning every winged bird, and all the wild beasts of the field, shall eat flesh and drink blood. The Most High is not telling the children of Israel that we are going to eat flesh and drink blood. He's speaking to the winged birds and the wild beasts of the field. Repent, you wicked Christian. Why would God tell us to do that? It's metaphorical. I pray that it is clear that the Most High was not speaking to the children of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 39. The message was for the wild beasts, the winged birds, to come and eat the flesh and drink the blood of the enemies of the Most High because he was going to destroy them and scatter their dead bodies on the mountains of Israel. In conclusion, the communion is a repulsive ritual in which pagans eat the flesh and drink the blood of their gods. Some Christians believe that this is literal and others say that it is symbolic. But this abomination is practiced by Christians to this very day. And some of them even try to use the Holy Scriptures which they refer to as the Old Testament, to justify this disgusting, repulsive behavior. Righteous Israelites must not partake in the eating of human flesh or the drinking of blood, whether literally or symbolically, because those that do these things are mocking the Most High God, and they will ultimately be destroyed. And with that I say, Salam.